Chapter 7. The Curse of Machinery And Pharaoh commanded the same day that the taskmasters of the people and their officers, saying, Ye shall no more give the people straw to make brick, as heretofore let them go and gather straw for themselves. And the tale of the bricks, which they did make heretofore, ye shall lay upon them, ye shall not diminish aught thereof. For they be idle, therefore they cry, saying, Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Let their more work be laid upon the men, that they may labor therein, and let them not regard vain words. Exodus 5, 6-9 through 9. Three issues were involved here, theological, judicial, and economic. Theologically, it was this question, Who is God, the gods of Egypt or the God of Moses? Judicially, it was this question, Who represented God in history? Pharaoh or Moses? Economically, it was this question. Does a decrease in the division of labor make men poor? According to the polytheistic theology of Egypt, Pharaoh was a god. He was the primary link between the realm of the gods and mankind. The Egyptian state was therefore divine. Pharaoh was the pinnacle at the top of this pyramid of earthly power. Moses was calling this theology into question. Pharaoh recognized this. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. Verse 2. Moses, at this point in the confrontation, was not calling for the exodus. He was demanding, not asking, that the Hebrews be permitted to journey three days from their compulsory work center, participate in a covenantal feast, and then return. Pharaoh recognized that this was an attack on his divinity, and therefore also on the legitimacy of the Egyptian state. This would be a festival of liberation. He refused to let them go. This was the beginning of the public confrontation between two cultures. One was thoroughly statist, the other was not. Pharaoh imposed negative sanctions on the Hebrews, but not on Moses. He sought to undermine Moses in the eyes of the people. The punishment was economic. Pharaoh's refusal to supply the Hebrew slaves with straw. Straw was a necessary ingredient in bricks. This new rule forced onto the slaves an additional task, gathering straw. This decreased the division of labor. It increased the cost of production. It therefore increased the workload on the slaves. That was the goal of the decree. Pharaoh understood basic economics. What if some inventor after this declaration had come up with a way to increase the output of straw gatherers? What if he invented a reaper that cut down the straw faster? Would this piece of machinery have increased the division of labor for the Hebrews? Of course. Would this have decreased the slaves' workload? Of course. Would this have been a benefit to the slaves? Of course. Would Pharaoh have outlawed the Hebrews' use of this invention? Of course. A problem that we face today is this. Modern politicians imitate Pharaoh. They adopt a comparable policy of restricting the introduction of tools that increase the division of labor and thereby increase the productivity of workers. They do so for the same reason that Pharaoh did, to increase the amount of labor necessary to complete the required tasks. What is different is this. They justify this as a humanitarian measure. Pharaoh knew better. He was a far better economist than the typical politician is today. Let us consider the economics of the hatred of labor-saving machinery. 1. Owners. Who are the owners and what do they own? There are multiple owners, an inventor with an idea, a customer with money to spend, a capitalist with money to invest, a businessman with organizational abilities, and also an assessment of the economic future, an owner of raw materials or land, and a worker with labor to sell. Each of them is legally sovereign over whatever asset he owns. He possesses the legal right to exclude others, the essence of ownership. Each of them wants to benefit from his property. Each of them needs the cooperation of others. They have the potential for increasing their wealth through cooperation. They all benefit from a private property legal order. This means that the free market itself is an economic asset. The legal rights of property are assets, but these assets are legally different from other forms of property. They cannot be bought and sold on an open market. Consider workers. Since the loss of jobs is the focus of the resentment against machinery, workers own the right to rent their labor services. Some new technique of production may or may not lead to greater income for all of them. If they become skilled in using the new machine, they will benefit from rising wages. But they may be dismissed from employment if the cost of the marginal output of the machine is less than hiring a laborer. 
The machine in no way interferes with the legal right of workers to make bids to employers. They do not own their jobs. They own only the right to make a bid for a job. Nobody owns a job. A job is the outcome of successful mutual bids, employers versus employers, and workers versus workers. Workers are not the only owners involved in the introduction of new machinery. All owners may be affected, but the legal and moral issue at hand is the right of all owners to make bids. 2. Window The business owner, the inventor of the new machine, the resource owner, the capital owner, and the worker all act as economic agents of future consumers. The consumers retain authority because they possess the most marketable commodity money. Their decisions in the future will determine which businesses, which inventors, and which workers were correct in assessing the future demand of customers. The system of economic sanctions in a free market economy mandates that producers serve the demands of customers. So from the point of view of customers, it is irrelevant whether a machine or a human being has produced what they want to buy. The customers want the best possible deal. If the introduction of machinery leads to a decrease in employment for certain workers, customers are probably unaware of it, and even if they are aware of it, most of them do not care. What they care about is themselves. In this respect, they are no different from the businessman who decides to buy the labor-saving machine, the inventor who sells the machine, and the workers who will use the machines in order to increase their personal output and thereby keep their jobs. If the labor-saving machine or process decreases the cost of labor for business, then in all likelihood the businessman will decide to increase total output in order to sell this output to a greater number of customers. In order to sell to more customers, the business will have to lower the prices of the final product. This is a benefit for customers, although it will not be a benefit to rival businesses, rival workers, and rival sellers of machinery. But the free market system is not structured so as to benefit producers at the expense of customers. It is an outcome of a private property system which inherently benefits customers. Customers shout, may the best man win, as determined by us. 3. Stone The stone is thrown at machines. Politicians do this in the name of protecting existing jobs. The politicians ignore customers. They ignore future jobs. These are the things not seen by politicians. Workers own jobs, but they do not. Only rarely do governments ban the use of labor-saving machinery in a direct manner, i.e. by passing a law against a particular machine. Instead, governments grant monopoly authority to certain groups, and these groups are then able to restrict the introduction of new labor-saving equipment, except on terms amenable to the groups. If a new production technique involves new machines, then it may receive considerable criticism, especially from members of labor unions. Labor unions enjoy special privileges that are granted by the government. When a labor union receives a majority vote among the existing employees of a business to represent all of the workers from that point on, the government does not allow the business to fire employees and then go into the marketplace to hire replacements. This is a grant of monopoly privilege. So the business may hesitate to introduce new machines. It does not want workers to go out on strike. The workers may oppose the introduction of the machine unless the employer guarantees that there will be no layoffs in response to the increased productivity of the new machine. This makes it more expensive for the employer to put the new machine into production. Governments often do not introduce new machinery or techniques in order to increase their own productivity. Their employees resist such introductions. This is an advantage for the private sector because the private sector can and does introduce new production techniques and these tend to escape the regulatory structure of the governments. Government regulatory agencies play catch up to new technologies in the private sector all the time. One way to counter the hostility against the introduction of new machinery is to ask the critic this question. Would it be wise to ban the use of shovels and mandate the use of spoons for building new highways? No. Would it be wise to ban the use of bulldozers and then hire more workers to use only shovels? No. Then what is the case for banning new machinery? The stone also disrupts the legal system of ownership. The threat to private ownership represented by the intervention reduces the wealth of all participants. The value of private property falls because the cost of defending it against the state rises. 4. Costs Whenever government regulations restrict the introduction of new machinery, 
or new techniques of production, this violates the ownership rights of business owners, inventors, and customers who then have to pay higher prices for whatever it is that they buy when they might have benefited from lower prices as a result of the introduction of new machinery. There is the basic cost of all government interference, namely a violation of ownership rights. This is resented by victims. This cost should never be ignored. It is usually ignored, and when it is not ignored, it is dismissed as an apology for the rich. In any case, it is clearly a denial of the rule of law. That is also a cost of operation. It is true that some workers may not lose their jobs as a result of the prohibition of the introduction of new machinery, but that only applies briefly. Rival companies then have an opportunity to buy the machine and begin production. The other firms are able to undercut the prices of goods and services offered by the firms that have been prevented by the state from introducing the new machines. If the ban is national, then foreign businesses will be able to buy the machine, increase production, and undercut the prices of the domestic manufacturers who had been prohibited from introducing the new technique or new machine. Competition is international. Stones thrown inside a nation's borders weaken the competitiveness of domestic workers and business owners. The employees of these businesses will lose their jobs anyway because the businesses will face shrinking markets. The businesses may even go out of business. 5. Consequences The result of legal restrictions on the introduction of new machinery or new processes of production inevitably reduces the wealth of those customers who would have purchased the output generated by the new machines, but who refuse to buy because prices remain high. Prices remain high because the new machine was not allowed to be introduced. Customers who were able to save money would then have spent the money on other things. They might have purchased other consumer goods. They might have set the money aside to invest in production goods, which in turn led to the production of more goods and services. But this does not happen when governments restrict the introduction of labor-saving machinery. The overall national result of government bans on labor-saving equipment is to increase the cost of production and thereby decrease output. This slows the rate of economic growth for the general population. This reduces people's wealth in the long run. Conclusion Hostility to the introduction of labor-saving tools is concentrated among employees of firms that are contemplating the purchase of such equipment. The general population usually is not concerned about new labor-saving equipment. The general population really does not care how goods and services are produced. Customers act in their own self-interest. They are always looking for better deals. They do not ask what kind of machinery made possible these deals. They do not ask how many employees were either hired or fired as a result of the introduction of these machines. In this case, the things not seen, unemployed workers, are on the side of those who favor the free market. Over the past 250 years, governments in the West have generally not been successful in restricting the introduction of new labor-saving equipment. This is why the West has experienced such remarkable economic growth decade after decade. Employees are focused in their concern about the introduction of such equipment. But unless they are members of labor unions, they probably are not going to be successful in persuading the government to restrict the introduction of a specific machine in a specific industry in a specific company. The politicians do not respond unless the workers can get out a lot of voters at the next election. Businesses in a specific industry are more likely to be able to put up large amounts of money for campaigns than workers in that industry are. There is another major economic factor that increases the likelihood that there will be no major restrictions on the introduction of new machinery. This is the fact that most increases of production do not come from the introduction of new machinery. They come from increases in the efficiency of computers and software. It is a lot cheaper to improve software than it is to invent, patent, produce, sell, and deploy a machine. As production moves away from manufacturing toward service industries, restrictions on the introduction of machinery becomes ever less relevant. There is almost no political resistance against the introduction of a specific piece of software in a specific business. This is good news. We are told that the introduction of computerized robotics will lead to mass unemployment. There is no evidence of this so far. In any case, what can the government do about it? How can the government restrict the implementation of upgrades in software?